hearts because the most important thing is we must be saved. Let's worship the Lord this morning and let's open our eyes and awaken to what God is doing in this last hour. Hallelujah. Would you say hallelujah? Would you shout it out today? Hallelujah. We give you praise in this place this morning, Jesus. Why don't you turn to someone, step across the aisle, welcome them to the house of the Lord. Make all of our guests feel welcome. Greet one another. Saints, encourage someone this morning. We're so glad that you're spending your Sunday morning with us. God bless you. Oh, go ahead, mix. I'm not going to sing for a little bit until people shake hands and welcome each other. So.
Hallelujah. Come on, clap your hands to the Lord this morning. Aren't you glad to be in the presence of the Lord? Come on, we can do better than that this morning, can't we? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, did you come expecting something this morning? We, you were here last night, we are living in the end times. But we're living in the greatest time. It's the greatest time to give yourself over to the Lord. This morning is a great morning for you to change your direction and change your course. And... You know, when you talk about end time, Brother Robin said, this isn't about fear. It's about believing that we are who we say we are and who he is. And at the end of the day, I want to be ready. At the end of the day, I want you to be ready. And if you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, today's a great day to be baptized in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. If, if you've never, raise your hands and begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives you the utterance to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Today is a great day. Yes, yes. If you're a guest here this morning, we believe in a God that heals and works miracles and all those kinds of things. And we're, I'm glad for that, aren't you? Amen. But the most important thing is, I, if I'm not healed this morning, I want to be saved this morning. That's the most important thing to me and should be the most important thing to you this morning. Amen. We had a great night last night. We had, uh, Brother Robbins did an amazing job. And we had almost, I don't know exact number, but almost 100 guests here last night. So... Give those people who ask people, give yourself a hand. Thank you for your getting out. And we thank the church people that came last night. We appreciate you being here and supporting. Had a great time. We're going to have a great Sunday. Brother Robbins will be with us again tonight. Everyone say 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock. He'll be with us tonight, our evangelistic service. We will, if you're a guest here this morning, we would love for you to come back and be with us uh, it's better than watching football on a Sunday night. You might as well come and be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 Let's one more time. Let's give all of our guests a hand for being with us this morning. Thank you on this Sunday morning for being and worshiping with us. So honored. So honored that you're here. Why don't you turn around as you go back to your seat, shake somebody's hand, tell them we're so glad. They're here this morning. Come on, get out of your five-by-five five area and shake somebody's hand that you usually don't shake. And tell them, so glad they're here this morning. Amen, amen. Like I said, brother and sister Robbins will be with us again tonight out front. If you have not been out front in the foyer, uh, sister Robbins is out there selling end time ministries uh, all kinds of things, uh, DVDs, books, all the, all kinds of things they they offer. So please go out there after service if you have not already done so. We had trunk or treat on. Oh, uh, well, I guess first off, this is our opportunity to give it of our tithe and offering. Apostolic Center reminder of that. You can give at the boxes on every corner and of course on the QR code. If you are a guest here this morning, behind every seat there's a, a QR code, a little. Uh, paper for you. Scan that. And you can see all the things that we have going on here at Apostolic Center. And also fill out your connection form. If you have not been uh, contacted by one of our connection specialists, we have a gift for you. If you go out these middle doors, turn to your right. Uh, right there is our welcome station. We have a gift for you after service if you have not already received that. Once again, so glad uh, that you're here with us. But we had on our Wednesday night, we had our trunk or treat. And we had over 1,200 people come on the facility, come for our trunk or treat. So give yourself a hand for that. Thank you for your support. About 5 o'clock, it was, it was raining pretty good. So we got a little nervous of what was going to happen. Uh, but, man, you couldn't beat the 75-degree weather. And so we appreciate uh, the Lord giving us that good night. But we want to I want to thank, if you were a part of uh, my MIT team or all the people that helped, will you stand real quick? I just want to. Uh, give them some honor to making that happen. I was gone for two weeks uh, right before that, and this team did all the work. So why don't you, if you stand, if you, if you see them around, amen. I thank them for all their hard work and making that, making that possible. 
And I said it uh, Wednesday night, and I, I appreciate also Brother Zach Isaacs. Not only did he set it all up, uh, the parking and everything, and then he was here Saturday in the rain tearing it all down, so we're ready for Sunday. So I appreciate him and his team uh, as well. Amen. Reminder, we, Brother Robbins mentioned it last night, we will be starting our End Time Prophecy Bible Study on Thursday nights. Everyone say Thursday night. Thursday night, Thursday night from 7 to 8 p.m., and it'll be right here in the sanctuary. So if you're a guest, the doors will be open. Come on in, and we will be setting, starting right promptly at 7 o'clock, and, and we'll have you out uh, right around 8 o'clock every night. Brother uh, Frank and Sister Katie Gilbert will be running uh, the Bible study uh, the next uh, multiple weeks. So we want you to come be a part. We're going to have a great time on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock. Also, if you have not got your booklet I know they were giving them out. Sister Tara has some more. If, if you'd like to have one of these, raise your hand right now. If you weren't here last night, and able because you need to fill out. I'm sure Brother Robbins might talk about that a little bit. There's a card in there to fill out if you want to be part of, of that Bible study. So please raise your hand, and Sister Terry will go around and, and give, you, uh, give you one of those booklets. But we're looking forward to having uh, Brother Robbins here again this morning and tonight. We're going to have a great Sunday. Amen? Come on, clap your hands one more time to the Lord as Brother Jeremy comes. The Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And um, I wanted to tell Apostolic Center that on Thursday, um, of course this week, uh, this is not intended to be a, a political exercise or uh, comments, but we elected a new Speaker of the House and viral uh, throughout the internet went a picture of him praying on the floor of the House of Representatives. And uh, I highly respected when he went to take his speech this week, he put his Bible down before he put his speech down uh, there at the lectern at the House of Representatives and honored God and it's very godly speech. I'm glad for godly leaders who cries that this nation is one nation under God. I want to tell you that I was sharing with Brother Robbins and I shared with Pastor Shine this week. On Thursday, I received a phone call. I had permission to uh, share this, and I know there are some other faith leaders that uh, Congresswoman Mary Miller had called, but on Thursday evening, about 8 o'clock, uh, Congresswoman Mary Miller called me and said, Jeremy, I wanted to tell you what a miracle that happened this week with uh, the election of Speaker Mike Johnson. She said, since she's been in Congress, which has been three years, there's been a group of about 15 or 20 uh, legislators, Congress people, who have met when they're in session and they're in D.C., they meet. It's a smaller group, and they pray, and they just don't have a, a word of prayer before they start, but they, they meet for a, an amount of time, and they pray, and they seek the face of God. And she said, two weeks ago, before this happened, that uh, Mike Johnson has always uh, been a part of that group. He's always gone to the prayer meetings where, where she's been with that small group of 10 to 15, not 15 to 20, I'm sorry, 10 to 15. He told them two weeks ago, he goes, people are going to think that I'm crazy. But he said, the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night at 3.30 in the morning and told me that I was going to be the next speaker of the house. That was not anywhere on the radar. She said, I hadn't heard his name. They, they, he wasn't out politicking. She said, I, we, he asked us to keep it confidential because it's a confidential prayer group. She said, this beginning of this week, I start, she said, I didn't tell my chief of staff. And at the beginning of the week, my chief of staff said, you know, there are some people that are starting to say his name. What do you know about him? And she said, I'm on board uh, for his election. She said, I didn't say that he had declared and prophesied or anything that he was going to be the Speaker of the House because she said, we, we didn't know. It wasn't for everyone to know. But she said, when he was elected, we absolutely believed this is a miracle from God because we heard from God. And she wanted that to be told, that God is doing something with this nation. Through all this Israel stuff and all the end time stuff, God is putting people in place for end time revival. 
Don't forget to pray for our president, our leaders, our senators. But I'm glad we have a Speaker of the House that understands that if chains are going to be broken, you got to go to the chain breaker. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, if you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies, if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life There's a better life If you got pain He's a pain taker If you feel lost He's a way Search for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know that just ain't right. And there's a better life. There's a better life. There's a better life. There's a better life.
Praise the name of the Lord. Amen, amen. Aren't you glad for the atmosphere that we feel here this morning? We are so excited once again to have Brother Robbins with us. Come, preach to us, teach to us, whatever you feel this morning. Reminder, 5 o'clock tonight, he'll be with us again. We're looking forward to a great Sunday. Let's give the man of God a hand as he comes to preach to us this morning. Good morning, everybody. I wonder if we could give a round of applause for the most important being here today, and that's God Almighty. Jesus Christ is here with us. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I worship you, Lord. I praise you. So thankful for your presence we feel here today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I love you, Lord. I worship you. If it wasn't for him, what are we doing here, right? Wasting our time. None of us would be here. But 2,000 years ago, Almighty God robed himself in flesh, born of a virgin, taught us, and died, was buried. Thank God he rose again. And we have a promise of salvation today. And um, I, go ahead and return to your seats. I've got, I'm not going to have much time here. I'm going to have to really be rolling, but... Um, I do want to invite you back tonight. Uh, today, probably won't have an altar call, even though I could have one right now, honestly. Uh, but today I won't have one. It won't lead to that. You'll see why. But tonight, we will. And I've got a message for everybody sitting here. And um, I have never taught the message that I'll teach tonight like I will tonight. And so it's the gospel of the kingdom of God like you may have never heard it. You say, well, you're gonna preach something different than Brother Dowdy. No, I will not. I was raised in this, believe me, I know exactly what the gospel of the kingdom of God is, but I'm gonna put a little twist on it that you may have never heard, and it's gonna be for everybody sitting here. So I'm inviting you back, five to seven, uh, we'll be having a wonderful evangelistic service. I know we kind of flipped this one on its head this morning, a little different than you might be um, used to, but inviting you back tonight, five to seven, and I'll be sharing some of my testimony, me and my wife, what God's done in our life, because it's never too late for somebody. I don't care, I don't care how you started out. I don't care what you've done in your life. A lot of saints are going around with guilt on them. Something you did 25 years ago, 20 years, Satan's hanging it over your head. Don't let him, that's, that's, a, that's the enemy. That's after your soul. And so we will, uh, saints, the church does not have to walk around with guilt hanging over you. That's Satan's, Satan's device. And so we're going to try to help you with that tonight. And um, we'll see what God will do. We'll have a wonderful altar call tonight. And God will minister to people. I don't care if you've been in church for 50 years. If God can't minister to you, then yikes. So anyway, we'll, uh, we'll get into that tonight. Um, really quickly, I want to say again, thank you to, I know Bishop's not here this morning. I think he's maybe under the weather, but um, I, I want to say how thankful I am for the Dowdies and, and um, the Dowdy family and um, Bishop, uh, Shine Dowdy and the Sanders and everybody having us here because I love this church. And when you come here to minister, I don't really feel like I'm coming in amongst even friends. It's kind of more like a family. They suck you in and you're just one of them. And it's pretty awesome. And so I, when, when we found out we were coming back here this year, I was like, man, this is, I love it. It made my whole year just about. I was looking forward to Mattoon. And <clears throat> so I hope you guys understand and, and appreciate what you have here. Um, because I, I'm in churches all over the United States some around the world, uh, every, every year, and um, you certainly should appreciate what you have here. And I know you do, but I can't say it enough uh, because it, you never know. It may not always be like it is now. You never know. And uh, thank God this, God's had this family here for 40 plus years. And wow, what, a, what an impact they've had on Mattoon. And it's not done yet, not done yet. You guys are not to capacity yet. There's still empty seats. 
And so we want to fill those up. We want to fill this big, uh, the big building next to us, whatever that is, your conference hall or gymnasium or whatever. We need to fill that up, have big screens out there, build another one. There's a cornfield right here. You guys got room. Come on. Uh, evangelism. Okay. Don't mean to stir everything up, but that's just who I am, guys. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so everybody, really quick. The magazine. Grab the magazine, turn to the envelope in the middle. I'm going to go through this a lot quickly, a lot quicker than I did last night. Uh, if you guys will go up and throw ahead, go ahead and throw up the screen, the first screen that I talked to you about. That, there you go. Thank you. Okay, I want to get the juices flowing here before I get started. Okay, in the magazine, the envelope in the middle. I'm going to collect these here in just a little bit, and it's going to be really quickly. So, uh, number one, there's a place on the top of the envelope to partner with End Time. End Time's a partner-supported ministry. We have people that partner with us for $5 a month and some people for $250 or $300 a month. But that's how our ministry is supported. And we have very faithful partners. So if you'd like to partner with us, we're reaching people literally all over the world. We have a huge effort going on in Israel, the Jerusalem Prophecy College. We own a physical college in downtown Jerusalem, 97 Jaffa Street, if you ever want to go in there and visit it. We have pastors and people, tours, tour groups come through there all the time. There, are, there is revival happening in Israel. I told everybody last night there are at least seven Filipino churches in Israel, UPC. There is a, Messian, a um, Hispanic church in Israel, UPC. And there's a lot of things happening. They're reaching people. They're reaching Palestinians and Jews. Uh, and so God wants to save everybody, right? And the Bible says, Daniel, uh, Revelation chapter um, 7, verse 9, John said, I saw a multitude in heaven that no man could number out of every kindred, people, tongue, and nation. So I'm reaching for everybody. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what your background is. I don't care if you live under a bridge or you're a billionaire. I'm reaching for everybody. <laughs> Amen. And I know this church has that mindset. And I'm very thankful for that. Um, if you're prejudiced, you're going to have a hard time in heaven because everybody's gonna be there. And I'm very thankful for that. So, it's gonna be awesome. I cannot wait. Okay, uh, there's a, uh, so if you wanna partner with us, man, we're reaching people all over the world. Join with us in that effort. Subscribe to End Time Magazine, End Time, very influential periodical. We've published it since 91. We've, to, and thankful to the Lord, we've never had to offer one retraction ever. It goes to Congress. It goes to all the, every governor, your governor gets it. Um, the governor of Illinois, the, uh, every, the, every president since George Bush. Um, and I've got, we've got letters. I've got signed books. I've got all kinds of stuff back from people. I know they're reading it. And so um, I certainly will be sending one to the new speaker of the house. We're going to be doing that immediately. And uh, it looks like he's kind of on our side. What an awesome a uh, testimony from um, Jeremy because he was telling us about uh, your congressperson here. And I, I believe God's, you know, e even things look impossible one day. It doesn't mean that it's not impossible. It just may look impossible today. God can turn America around tomorrow with one miracle. And if, um, if you understand during the time of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den, God used one miracle, Daniel in the lion's den, to turn King Darius. And when he, Daniel came out of the lion's dead, King Darius, what'd he say? Nobody's gonna serve anybody in my kingdom but Daniel's God. He turned a, a global empire around with one miracle, one night in the lion's den. Think about it. The three Hebrew children, when they went in the fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar, when they came out, said, nobody's gonna serve anybody but these guys, God. So, maybe Joe Biden could be a Nebuchadnezzar. Never know. You never know. With God, all things are possible. So even though it looks impossible now, it doesn't mean it's going to be impossible tomorrow. So subscribe to End Time Magazine. It'll keep you up to date on what all's going on. It's so cool. Uh, my blood, sweat, and tears goes into this thing bi-monthly. I'm telling you. Wow. Three things that I hated in high school. Three things. I hated studying history. I hated public speaking. And I hated writing well, guess what God has called me to do? <laughs> All three of those, every day. And I, I'm telling you, when I told you things looked impossible and they're not impossible now, that's it. Because that's what I do and I love it. Because I see the pen is certainly mightier than the sword. 
And so I'm very thankful to God for the, that calling on my life. Okay, so End Time Magazine. Uh, number, the fourth thing, bottom right-hand side, there's two red sentences. Number one, End Time, every week our staff puts together an e-weekly newsletter, videos, clips, uh, articles, and different things from that week showing you current events and how they're, they're the fulfillment of Bible prophecies written 2,000 to 2,500 years ago. So if you'd like to receive that, we sent out, I don't know how many tens and tens and tens of thousands of these. Um, on every Friday morning, I get mine, and sometimes those guys will come up with articles that I didn't see, and I'm like, I'm on the radio and television. Why didn't you show me these articles? And they're like, I don't know. We just saw it yesterday, and we put it in there. So um, if you'd like to receive that, fill in the left side and put your email legible. Uh, if you're a doctor, have your wife fill it out because we've got to be able to read it when we get back to the office. Uh, that's the, one of the number one complaints that I get from the conferences that I do is we can't read the email, but everybody wants the email e-weekly newsletter. It's free, and, so, um, and if you ever get tired of it, the unsubscribe button actually works. So uh, fill that out, and we'll send you that. Now, most important sentence on this envelope, the bottom right side, the, the I want to join an end time Bible study. Pastor Sanders uh, mentioned it earlier. However, this coming Thursday at seven, uh, we, they'll start the end time Bible study here. Some of you may say, well, I've been through that. You have not been through this. The, this is all brand new. We just finished it a few months ago. And so uh, every, it's all updated. We, Brother Baxter, in the, when we went in television in 2009, he produced everything. But he was talking about Ahmadinejad and as the president of Iran, that's long gone. He was talking about George Bush, all kinds of stuff. Well, that's all, that's gone. Everything's brand new in there, new proofs that we found. It's so cool, uh, new proofs for the four horsemen. There's so much new stuff in there. You gotta go through the new one. Say, well, I've already been through it all. Bring somebody, bring somebody. Uh, it, you know, they, 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 actually the conferences that I've been doing, the Bible studies have been, we've signed up tons of Bible studies in each one. It's been awesome because right now, especially right now, the time, you guys, the things that are going on overseas, a direct fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And so certainly want to make sure that you guys attend the Bible study at seven, start seven o'clock here this coming Thursday, right here in the auditorium. And, um, brother Frank and Katie Gilbert are going to be over it. Is that the guy that was praying today? Is that man? I would take, I wanted him to travel with me. That guy was awesome. Uh, that was man. He could open for me in prayer every time. That was so awesome. Uh, I mean, he got after it. And uh, he, that was not lay me down to sleep and all that. I mean, it was going. So come on now. That's what I'm talking about. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So if you're going to pray, get up here and get after it. Okay, I'm just saying. I don't know who all prays, but that was awesome. So anyway, he's going to be over the Bible study. It's going to be great. So if you'd like to sign up for that, Check the box, and I'll collect these envelopes here in just a little bit. Okay. For those running the PowerPoint, are you ready? I know you are, because I talked to you earlier, and you were ready back there. So here we go. Now, what we're going to do, i am changed it up a little bit. My father-in-law used to do this all the time, and it was awesome, and people loved it. And so um, I have been doing these in my conferences, and it's been so cool. And well, again, we'll have an altar call tonight. And I know you guys know how to do altar calls. You're like Matt Tuttle's church. He told me, he said, man, we know how to do altar calls. I know this church does as well. And here's the thing. Another thing I want to mention. All you guys that come up front when, you guys, when they start singing, don't ever stop that. That's a booming, rocking church. Don't ever stop that. God's letting you know we're all in. Or you're letting God know we're all in here. So don't ever stop that. You know altar calls. My life has been changed at one trip to an altar. So don't ever stop coming up around the front. I'm just saying, I love this church. I love it. I love everything about it, okay? Um, so don't ever stop that. That's so awesome that you guys do that. Not every church does that. When I say you need to be thankful for what you have here, I'm telling you, just the worship that you have is so awesome. So we love it. Come on, don't ever stop that. Okay. So here's what we'll do. Uh, let me hold right there. Let me do one here. Okay. No, well, let me go back to the first one. I'm sorry. So here's what we're going to do today. I'm going to teach you for about, oh, let's say 20, 25 minutes. We're gonna real, I'm going to go through 11 slides in 25 minutes. You ready? And, so, uh, and then after that, we're going to do a time of Q&A. 
You'll raise your hand. We'll have two roving mics. Brother Sanders and uh, Jeremy Dowdy's going to go around with the mics. Don't grab the mic from them, okay? Because the, you can never get it back. I told them, don't give, any, go give somebody the mic because we'll never get it back. But um, raise your hand, and they will, they will hold the mic, ask your question in one sentence if it's possible. Uh, this is not testimony service because I've been through a bunch of these. To ask your question. What about this? Bing, bing, bing. And I want to tell you before we do the q and I'm not here to disprove anything you've been taught. That's not my goal. I'm here to win souls. But I'm here to give you my opinion on what I think. How's that? Because I know you guys sit under great, awesome, wonderful teaching. And so um, that will be the goal of the Q&A. But it's, it's a lot of fun. So anyway, that's what we'll do here at maybe um, 10 till or so. Okay, so really quickly, all the five of these guys are involved in Bible prophecy. Uh, the current Pope, Pope Francis, obviously. The um, Benjamin Netanyahu, he's Prime Minister of Israel. He's in the thick of it right now, believe me. Uh, I'm, I'm sh- I, I think this, this is our ice cream man, uh, Joe Biden. The next guy, um, I, I didn't say, stay off, poli- stay off politics, Dave, come on. And the next guy, current Secretary General Antonio Guterres, and the next guy is uh, Vladimir Putin. He's the leader of Russia. All five of those guys are in, are in one way or another directly in, uh, involved in the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Okay, now, okay, here we go. So Jesus said, um, and now I have told you before it comes to pass that when it comes to pass, you might believe. The, one of the main reasons for Bible prophecy is it builds your faith in the word of God. If I can use current events today to show you how prophecies 2,000 to 2,500 years ago are coming to pass right now, it will build your faith in that book. And that's the main goal for me is to build your faith in the book that is the only book on the planet that has the words to eternal life. You, you can read self-help books, you can read all kinds of other religious books. I didn't say religious book, I'm talking about the Bible. That The Bible is different than a lot of religious books that are out there. You gotta be very, 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 very careful of what you read. Even, though it's, even if it says Christian book, you gotta be careful what you read today. You better know the truth and know. That's why when I talk about the, the, the pastoral team here, they teach, they will, they're not going to move off the truth. They're not going to move this much. And throughout the end time, you better super glue yourself to this place because they're going to get you to heaven, folks. And if, the place, if you're in a place that can get you to heaven in the midst of chaos and turmoil and everything else that's going on in this crazy, nutty world, I would super glue myself to this place if I live near Mattoon, Okay. I live in Dallas, so I've super glued myself somewhere else. But very important. So prophecy, it'll build your faith in the word of God. Let's walk through some prophecies here really quick because we certainly are living in the end time. Now, the first one I want to mention is the world's greatest war, World War III. Uh, there are six major prophecies I'm going to take you through really quick. World War III, Revelation 9, verse 13 through 21. The Bible says, loose the four angels bound in the great river Euphrates, for to kill a third part of all of mankind. And the, the Bible says there are a 200 million man army will participate in that war. If you understand what's going on in Israel right now, the Iranians have a ring of fire around Israel. I may have mentioned this last night. If I, if you, if I did, I apologize, but I'll probably do that for many of these. They have the ring of fire around Israel, terrorist proxies, Surrounding Israel right now in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, it down in Gaza in the south, Yemen in the south, the Houthis is a terrorist proxy of Iran. And they also have them in the belly of Israel, which is the West Bank region in Janine and other ones. There are terrorist factions. They actually killed a couple terrorists in Janine just, uh, what, latter part of last week. And so I'm very, very familiar with Janine and the things that are happening there. There's terrorist uprisings and different things. They're all supported by Iran. That's the head of the snake. And so the Bible says, loose the four angels bound in the great river Euphrates. The river Euphrates is housed in Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran, where the um, Euphrates River meets the Tigris right there. The last 56 miles, it forms the border right there before it goes into the Persian Gulf. Now look at what's going on. All four of those nations are involved in this current conflict. Uh, My wife and I were there. We had a tour group of 40 people. We were there up on Mount Masada when the first bombs kicked off. 
We all looked at our tour group like, what in the world was that? We looked at our guide. He was like, and he, about that time, it was 60 seconds, he got the call from his, um, the Sarel Tours, and he said, get your team, get your group down, go straight back to the hotel. We were gonna go to the Dead Sea, go to Qumran and eat lunch. He said, no, go back to, go back, straight back to the hotel. Everything's closed. Uh, we just got invaded by, we, well, we didn't know at that point that we didn't got invaded. He said, they just said, we've just got bombed. It's in that region where you guys are at. Get back to the hotel. So that was, the, that was on October the 7th. It was on a Saturday. Most of you know what happened that Iran breached, or um, Gaza, the Hamas breached the fence down there in Gaza. They came through, uh, they raised, they tore it down with bulldozers. They come through with Jeeps, motorcycles. Thousands of terrorists came through. Uh, they were coming across in gyrocopters and they came across through the Mediterranean Sea. And they came in there and they kidnapped. It's now like 200 and some people are being kidnapped. They slaughtered people like you cannot even imagine if you follow the news. I don't want to get super graphic, but in the most horrendous way, it's the worst terrorist attack Israel's ever experienced. We were up on Mount Masada when that happened down in the, by the Dead Sea. And they started shooting rockets. At one point, they shot 2,700 rockets into Israel at one time, 2,700. And the Iron Dome missile defense system took all of them down but four. And so, the, thank God for that Iron, the Iron Dome missile defense system. It saved our life. We, we lived through, my wife and I and our tour group lived through three missile attacks where the sirens went off and we had to go to the bomb shelters and stuff. It was crazy. I had 40 people there on an Israel tour. Been taking two tours a year for decades. And uh, we lived through, I think, 10 days of that and finally got on our, there were tour groups leaving. We were one of, we were one of the last, if not the last, we were told, tour groups to leave Israel. And uh, they went into complete lockdown mode. We ended up out in Netanya, and uh, it was one of the safest places in the country. It was just strictly a move by God that ha that, that happened. We'd never been out there before. And uh, the G Sea of Galilee, all that was, it was against the law to go up there. We had a guy that tried to get in a, rent a cab to go up there, and they told him, don't get out of your cab or we're gonna arrest you. We're in a state of war, don't you understand? And so it was pretty crazy. But thank God he kept his hands upon us. We made it home. But what I'm telling you this for is this could be the beginning of that with this World War III scenario. All four nations that house the Euphrates are involved in this. It, could it go away tomorrow? I don't know if it'll go away tomorrow. Could it go away at some point? It could. We thought it, at one point the Syrian civil war where, where China and Russia and the United States and all these countries were involved that that could be, but it wasn't. But I'm telling you, standing here today, in the very near future, it's one of the next events to occur on God's prophetic timeline. There is a war coming. World War III is coming. There's not one-tenth of one percent chance that it won't. It's prophesied in the Bible. The first five of the other uh, trumpets have already occurred in the book of Revelation. I'll go through those here in just a moment. So this World War III is coming. It will begin soon if we are not already in it. Netanyahu just said yesterday that Israel is fighting its second war for independence. They fought, they fought their first war for independence after they declared independence in 1948. The day after they declared independence, five nations invaded Israel, and they won that war of independence. Netanyahu said yesterday, what's going on right now is our second war for independence. They realize there's an existential threat against Israel right now. So that's something you certainly need to be watching for uh, it's one of the six prophecies that will come to pass very soon if we're not already in it. The second one is a Middle East peace agreement. Uh, give me one more slide there. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll do them so you can see me. Uh, there we go. A Middle East peace agreement that will begin the final seven years. Those are the next two, the war and the peace agreement uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians that will fight this, that'll begin the final seven years of the second coming of Jesus Christ and the battle of Armageddon. It's found in Daniel 9, 27. The Antichrist will confirm a covenant with many for a seven year period, for one week, but it's a week of years, seven years. And the entire prophecy is found in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. It's a 490 year prophecy. The final seven years is just ahead of us now. We didn't, we haven't known, I can't prove scripturally which one happens first, the peace agreement or the war. However, it appears, imagine this, and I'm, I'm speculating. Imagine if the Israeli-Palestinian situation is the thing that starts the war. That's what's going on right now. And a peace agreement is the thing that ends the war. They're pushing for a peace agreement right now. Joe Biden is saying, we've got to have a two-state solution to stop what's going on. 
He's pushing, pushing, pushing. Europeans are pushing for it. And imagine if they both happen simultaneously. That's why I can't prove scripturally which one happens first. But we're not really in the end time, right? Come on, you guys know better than that. You know better than that. All this stuff is happening like this. All of these. The United Nations will continue to draw its drive towards becoming a world governing body. The United Nations was established to be a world governing body. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a globalist. He believed in a world governing body. He put new world order on our dollar bill in 1935. The United Nations was, charter was not signed until 1945. Look on your dollar bill. The, the ribbon under, the, under the, all seeing, the pyramid with the all seeing eye, look at the ribbon. It says Novus Ordo Seclorum. New world order. New secular order of the world. New world order. FDR was a globalist. And man, I could go off to you in a story about Pearl Harbor that would blow your mind. Uh, G. Edward Griffin, the guy who wrote Creature from Jekyll Isle, I had him on my program the other day, and he said it was in con the congressional record guys testified that that was a necessary loss to get America involved in the war. I said, you have got to be kidding me. He says FDR knew all about it because they had to get us involved in World War II and we were dragging our feet. So what was the event that got us involved in World War II? Pearl Harbor. I, was, I, I, I thought that for years, but I, didn't, I couldn't prove it. But I talked to G. Everett Griffin, who was a very well-read, studied guy. I just, it's super intelligent. I had him on my program. He's in his 90s. He's sharp as a tack still. And he told me about that, and I was like, wow, I didn't, I didn't expect that, but oh, my goodness. So anyway, the United Nations was created after World War II. It's second effort. After World War I, it was the League of Nations. In the mind of the international community, you've got to have a world government to solve world war ever again. They had the League of Nations after World War I, after World War II. The League of Nations, which was already basically established. They wrote the charter and they were ready to go. The concentration camps were liberated in Europe and we bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki both in 1945. The charter for the United Nations was written by a man named Alger Hiss, who was like, uh, you remember what Henry Kissinger was to Nixon? Well, Alger Hiss was the same thing to FDR. He was just attached to his hip. FDR was a dying man at the end of his term, end of World War II, so he let Alger Hiss carry most of the negotiations. He would go into these big meetings and he was the one that negotiated and why Russia got so much of Eastern Europe after World War II. Well, the thing is, he ended up being a communist spy. He ended up getting charged for perjury for lying about his being a communist spy in court. He went to prison for three years, but he was the architect of the United Nations Charter, a communist spy. So it was, the United Nations was created to be a socialistic, communistic, one world governing body. Guess how many words of that charter has changed? Not one. The United Nations still functions under the charter that Alger Hiss was the architect of. But guess what? I've been to the United Nations many times, and if you ask your guide who's taking you through there, who's Alger Hiss? Because his picture's not on the wall of any of them. He was the first acting secretary general. But when they have all the secretary generals, his, name's not, his picture's not up there. Who's Alger Hiss? They'll say, Alger Hiss? They don't want you to know that they were connected to him at all because he was a communist spy and he created the whole thing. So the United Nations is not the last great humanitarian hope for mankind. It's a, it's a socialistic world governing body is what it is. The Bible says the last world government on the earth will be ran by the Antichrist and that world government will be a socialistic world governing entity. But we're not really in the end time though, right? Come on. I can teach it different than the apostles did. I'll be teaching the gospel of the kingdom of God tonight with a prophecy twist on it. Because I can teach it different than the apostles. They didn't understand the writings of Daniel. We can. God said, Daniel, you close up and seal that book because that's for the people of the time of the end. Daniel chapter 12, you can read it. And so the apostles couldn't understand, but we can understand. Now, there's also going to be a world religion established. Um, you consider the religions for peace. Consider the parliament of world's religions that is established. They just met in Chicago, and uh, they're pushing world governing um, agendas, world governing propaganda, climate, human-induced climate change, which human-induced global warming, which leads to climate change. It's absolute propaganda. It's a hoax. 
but they're trying to establish a world governing body and they gotta have a constant perpetual crisis to keep everybody stirred up and scared to death so where they'll buy into their edicts. That's what it's all about. It's all about wealth redistribution because they're socialistic. All the propaganda coming from the United Nations is socialistic propaganda, redistribution of wealth. That's what it's all about. So, it, the world, they know that they have to have the world religions on board. My father-in-law interviewed years ago a guy named Robert Mueller who was the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. Interviewed him on a radio program. Robert Mueller said, Irvin, we brought this world government as far as we can politically. We need a, what we really need is a United Nations of religions to get the religions on board with this thing so, we, so, the, so the religions will support what we're trying to do. Well, guess what? The religions today are being weaponized to do that. I just heard a, uh, I did an interview or with a guy the other day. His name is Alex Newman. I was on his program. And he, he, uh, just prior to that, I watched something he did. He's over the New American, which is the old John Birch Society. He's over their magazine. He's a senior editor, a bunch of stuff. Well, anyway, I, I'm, I'm very familiar with him, and I've always wanted to have him on my program. Well, he asked me to be on his. And so I thought, man, this is awesome. Well, anyway, he told about a, the way they're weaponizing religions is there was a, you guys know about Tony Spell in Louisiana and uh, Pastor Art Hodges out in California who they weren't gonna close their church during COVID, okay? Well, um, there was another church in Florida that said, no, we're not gonna close for this. And the, some of the politicians around there got other churches, they weaponized them and got them in the news media to demonize that church for not closing. Well, we're as Christians and we closed and they need to close. I can't believe that that church wouldn't close. They got the pastors of some of the other churches to demonize that church. The politicians did. So that's how they're, that's what they're doing. They're weaponizing some of the churches now against other churches. That's what I'm saying. You better thank God for what you have here because these guys wouldn't think about doing something like that. So it's very, very important. Mark of the beast. Um, that in world, the, the uh, world religion is something you absolutely cannot participate in the future. That's a, that's a big no. Uh, Mark of the Beast, I talked about it last night. There's several things that we're watching, precursors of the Mark of the Beast. The Mark of the Beast will not be doled out until the Antichrist comes on the scene. Well, precursors, we're watching global economic sanctioning system. One of the leading things, there's facial recognition photographs, there's retinal scans, all kinds of things leading to it. There are people that are actually, there are thousands and thousands of people putting chips in their skins in Europe chips in their skin. Well, one of the things I'm seeing here in the United States that's a global effort is the central bank digital currency. I talked about it last night, but it's a way for them to globally economic sanction individuals. Right now we sanction nations. We don't want Iran to get a nuclear weapon, so we sanction, sanction, sanction them until Joe Biden comes along and then lifts the sanctions and starts pouring billions of dollars into their coffers. But Donald Trump was hammering them with sanctions, sanctions trying to get them to bow down to the edicts of what we wanted them to do. Well, the Antichrist will do that on an individual level. Everybody will give them their own mark without which they're gonna be able to buy or sell. Economic sanctioning, that's what it's all about. To get you to bow down to the edicts of the world governing body. We're watching precursors of that right now. That's what, the central bank digital currency is one of the main precursors that I'm seeing right now. And the Bible says there's gonna be a global economic sanctioning system that the Antichrist will eventually usurp authority over. He's not, the Antichrist is going to, going to have three and a half years to reign. So he's not going to come on the scene and say, man, how am I going to run this world? I probably ought to establish a world governing body. No, he's going to usurp authority over an already fully functioning world governing body, which is being established right now. The United Nations is the seat of that world government. He's going to usurp, the false prophet will usurp authority over an already fully functioning world religious system that's being created. That's being created right now. And then they will also usurp authority over a fully functioning global economic sanctioning system, which is being established right now. If you understand anything about, um, if you're, uh, so anybody that's invested in cryptocurrency, if you understand blockchain technology, all of this is going to be tied into that. Central bank digital currencies, that's why they're trying to move us off of cash onto a digital platform. Uh, there is an entity that works with the United Nations called the Better Than Cash Alliance. The sole reason for its existence is to get the, to work with governments around the world to get their nations to go cashless. Australia is almost totally cashless now. 
I had a guy come to on our tour. His name was Peter Loosemore and his wife. And he was, we were talking about different things that are happening in Australia. I knew it from the news, but when he got there, we talked about it. They're, they're going almost cashless now. Many nations are. And they're in the United States. When you go to uh, American Airlines now, go to an Admiral's Club and try to buy a sandwich. No cash. They only take cards. No cash. You can pull out the cash and say, I got $20. Give me my sandwich. Can't do it cashless. American Airlines, many others. There's cashless stores everywhere now. And they're trying to move us off of cash because they want to move us on a totally digital platform because I can economically sanction everybody in this room right now. If I gave you a number, X, Y, Z, one, two, three. And then if you don't bow down to my edicts, eventually it's called um, social credit scores. You don't comply with society. Sorry, we're not going to give you access to society then economically. That's mark of the beast. We're, it's pointing us in that direction. But we're not living in the end time though, right? Come on now. The last one I want to talk about, great end time revival. In the midst of all this, we can have revival. We're going to have revival. The greatest time of revival is ahead of us during the end time. I mentioned it earlier. During, you say, well, how are we going to do all that in the, under the reign of a world government? Easy. The same way the apostles did. They were under the reign, the Rome, Romans ruled the world during the era of the apostles. During, that's why there were cru, um, Roman soldiers at Jesus' crucifixion. That's why he was taken before a Roman judge, Pontius Pilate. Because Rome ruled the world and they had occupying forces in Jerusalem when Jesus was here and the apostles. But look, the entire New Testament, everything they did was under the reign of a world government. Even so much that they established a church in Rome. The book of Romans is written to the church in Rome, right? You guys know all this. In Rome, you know how horribly debaucherous Rome was, and yet they established a church there. So what are we going to do under the reign of a world government? We're going to have revival. I'm an evangelist. I'm going to evangelize. I don't care if, they're, if I got to go to prison, which may happen. I'm at the tip of the sword on this stuff. I'm all, we're all, Irvin Baxter and us, we're, we've been blacklisted for years at speaking at the United Nations. That's why Art Wilson ended up going, because we couldn't go. You guys know who Art Wilson is, right? United Nations representative and all that. We were supposed to go, and my father-in-law was blacklisted. Oh, Irvin Baxter with End Time Ministries? No. Nope. So Art Wilson ended up going. So they know who we are. You talk about being censored. I've had radio programs for years, cut off halfway through, talk about them censoring us on Facebook. I've got strikes from YouTube and all kinds of stuff if we talk about sensitive issues. Do we quit talking about those? No, I can't. So we're gonna keep on teaching on them. So we're gonna have revival. That's the goal of End Time Ministries is revival. You'll see tonight what we're all about. I've been teaching, 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 teaching tonight. I'll get a preach. It's going to be awesome. And I'm inviting you all back because it's going to be an evangelistic message. And so, uh, but it's what we're all about. Revival, revival, revival. Everybody that's been to Israel with us. I see several people here that's been to Israel with us. You understand what end time's all about? We, I, we baptized 18. Uh, oh, where is the Warnocks here this, tonight? Right here. Those people just got baptized in the Mediterranean Sea before we left Israel on this trip we were just on. It was awesome, wasn't it? Amen. So it was a great time because we're all about revival. That's what we're gonna be doing in the end time. So with that said, let me skip a couple slides here. Keep on going right here to 11, right here. Uh, next one, right there. There's a timeline, really quick. So the Middle East Peace Treaty, it'll start the final seven years. Either just before or just after that, World War III will happen. And then after that, and I'm gonna go through this quick because I'm about done here and we'll go to the Q&A. If you got a question, get it ready. Write it down, you got one sentence, okay? So <laughs> that's, hey, we're gonna keep it going fast. So the, um, the final seven years, the Temple, uh, temple Mount's gonna be placed under a sharing arrangement during the first three and one half years. I've got that divided into two, two, three and a half year periods. The Jewish temple will be re rebuilt. Animal sacrifices will be resumed. I don't have time to go into the red heifers, but I could tell you all about that. Then at the halfway point, there's a war in heaven. Satan's banished to the earth. That's when the great tribulation starts. It's, the great tribulation is Satan's wrath, not God's wrath. And that's when the Antichrist is revealed and the false prophet is revealed as well. That's when the great tribulation starts. The great tribulation is the last half of that final seven-year period. 
Um, the two witnesses will begin their ministry. And then during the Great Tribulation, that's when the Antichrist will be in control of the world governing bodies. That's when the mark of the beast is doled out during that last three and one half year period. At the very end is the Middle East Peace Treaty expires. The Battle of Armageddon takes place. The second coming of Jesus takes place. Um, the Jews are going to meet their Messiah. All of Israel is going to be saved at that point. And then um, the Antichrist and false prophet are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Satan's thrown in the bottomless pit. And that begins the 1,000-year millennial reign, which is the kingdom of God on the earth. Remember this timeline tonight when I'm talking about the kingdom of God. At the end of that final seven-year period is when Jesus Christ comes back to establish his kingdom here on the earth. And I'll be going into that in uh, quite a bit of detail tonight. So that's the final seven years ends. That's when the Lord, the second coming of Jesus Christ happens. We are just prior to or just, uh, just prior to this peace treaty being signed. And if we're not already in it, World War III occurring and the final seven years happening. So there's a timeline. We can leave that up here during the uh, Q&A. So are we in the end time? Absolutely we are. Uh, the world's greatest war is about ready to happen if, if we're not already in it. And I can't tell you. Okay, uh, one more thing. Uh, can you back up a slide? Give you a little bit of timing here. Just think about the timing of this, and then we'll go into the Q&A real quick. So World War III and the Middle East uh, Peace Agreement, those, when I say they're the next two things to happen on God's prophetic timeline, think about this. A 2,000-year-old prophecy. Let's, okay, y'all can see it over here. So... The, the trumpets in the book of Revelation, they are the skeletal structure. The seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials. It's the skeletal structure of the book of Revelation. Okay? On the seven trumpets, the first trumpet starts in uh, Revelation chapter 8 and it ends in 11. There's a parenthetical chapter in there, but they, if you start with the first trumpet, I'm not going to take, you'll learn all this in a Bible study in triplicate. I'm talking 90 to nothing, you can tell. The Bible study is going to slow way down and walk you through this and give proof for everything. I won't have time to do that this morning. However, the first trumpet was World War I. Now look, it's a 2,000-year-old prophecy, but look at when they begin. First trumpet, World War I, 1914 to 1918. The second trumpet was World War II, 39 to 45. The third trumpet was the Chernobyl nuclear accident on April 26, 1986. The fourth trumpet was the shortening of the days and the speeding up of time with the process of globalization, with the tearing down of the Berlin Wall. That was November 9th, 1989. That actually, the, uh, my father-in-law's book about, and when he published that in 1986, was really the thing that launched End Time Ministries. Um, and then the Berlin Wall came down in 89, three years later after he published it in a book. Everybody, all the news people were like, how in the world did you know that? He said, it's in the prophecies of the Bible. And then... The fifth trumpet was the Iraq war with Saddam Hussein. That was um, 1991. And then, so the next two events on God's prophetic timeline. But look at this real close. The 2,000-year-old um, prophecy, but the first five have occurred in just over the last 100 years. Okay? But we're, you still understand we're not living in the end time. I'm not trying to convince you of that. You understand what I'm saying here? Look at how fast these things are happening. The last three, 86, 89, and 9091. Now the next two on God's prophetic timeline is the sixth trumpet war. And then guess what happens at the seventh trumpet, the final trump? We're out of here. So do we have a job? Does the church have a job? Absolutely. Evangelize, evangelize, evangelize. Say, no, no, I'm going to go hold up in Colorado in a cave and bury myself and make sure people don't get my food. Nope. That's not the role of the church in the end time. The role of the church is evangelize, evangelize. The, the, um, yeah. Daniel 11, 32 and 33. The Bible says during the time of the Antichrist that they that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits and they that understand among the people shall instruct many. The church in the end time will not be a weak, anemic organization hiding in a cave somewhere. No. The apostles evangelized, evangelized. They were ignited for evangelize, evangelism in the end time. We got to teach, teach, teach. Jesus said, when you receive this power, what are you going to do? You'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. When you receive the Holy Ghost, it makes you want to share it with everybody. You say, but I'm not going to do that. Well, what happened? What happened? Evangelize, evangelize, evangelize. That's the goal in the end time. You cannot reap a harvest that you do not sow. Okay, we got a lot of farmers sitting here, right? 
Got farmers all over the place. Okay, what, what kind of a, you would be out of your mind. Your wife would think you were nuts. If in October, if, if in the spring, she says, well, honey, you're gonna go plant the beans and the corn this year? And you say, no, nah, I don't think so. And she would think, what? We've been farming for 50 years. You're not gonna plant anything in the spring? No, nah, I don't think I'm gonna skip that step this year. But then when October, early part of November gets here, you go out and fire up the combine and you head out towards the field and your wife goes, what in the world are you doing? I'm going out to harvest. And she says, but you didn't, you didn't sow any seed in the spring. And you say, well, I don't care. I'm, gonna go. I'm looking for a harvest. But you didn't sow anything. You didn't, you didn't sow the seed. So it, a farmer has to sow the seed and then you can expect a harvest. The Bible says, he that sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He that sows bountifully will reap bountifully. This church's job is to sow the seed, sow the seed, sow the seed, and guess what will happen? It's a law. You will reap a big harvest. That's the job. So in the end time, we're sowing the seed, sowing the seed. The reason these guys have me here is because I'm a seed sower. I'm sowing the seed to everybody I can get my hands on around the world, and guess what? We're seeing a gigantic harvest coming in. The only reason that what's happening in Israel is because we've sown the seed, sown the seed for years, and uh, our missionaries and different people in Israel, now we've got churches established there where people thought it was impossible. So we're seed sowers, that's the goal. Harvest, 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 but you don't get a harvest unless you sow the seed, right? You guys farmers all know this, They're, you're all over the place, I know. And so you can't live in a community like this and not have some farmers in here. So I'm just telling you, that's the way it goes. You've got to sow the seed, then you can expect to reap a harvest. So the, the world's greatest revival um, is just ahead of us. The apostles had wonderful revivals, but they could number them. 3,000 was added to the church. 5,000 was added to the church. But John said, I saw a multitude in heaven no man could number. Out of every kindred, people, tongue, and nation. And the elder looks at John and says, who are these individuals arrayed in white robes and where'd they come from? And John says, I don't know, thou knowest. And the elder says, this is Revelation 7, the elder says, these are they that came out of great tribulation. Go, 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 go ahead one and back to the timeline. These are they that came out of great tribulation. When's the great tribulation? The final three and one half years. There, were, there was a multitude no man could number in heaven. John saw a future vision of heaven that came out of the great tribulation. Read Revelation chapter seven, uh, nine through 14. <clears throat> the greatest time of revival the world's ever seen is ahead of us. And we're sowing seed right now for that. We're seeing it trickle in, trickle in. But I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of people coming. Are we ready for that? Is the church ready for a thousand soul revival? You say, Dave, that's impossible. What? This is the church of Jesus Christ in the end time. You know, in a, in, a, in a relay race, you save your strongest runner for win. The last leg. The last leg. And Daniel said, during the time of the Antichrist, that church is going to be strong and do exploits. Some people that have never won a soul is going to be your greatest soul winners in the end time. You say, I, but, you say but Dave, I'm, I'm 50. I'm getting on my message tonight, man. But uh, if, Dave, I'm, I'm, I'm 40, 50 years old, it's too late for me. You've got to be kidding me. It's never too late. And I'll get into that tonight. I don't want to do that. But anyway, okay, we got a little bit of time left. So if we can, let's do the Q&A real quick. We'll take a few of them. Um, my goal is to get you out of here by 1115, okay? Because we're going to be back in here at five, and I want you time to eat something, take a nap, and be back in here ready to rock and roll tonight, okay? So very important. So if you got a question, raise your hand, and then um, try to condense it down. Okay, I had somebody ask me one. I'll get it started. Somebody gave me a paper last night. Um, how does AI fit into the end time or does it? So AI could play a part. Uh, I'm not really as concerned about AI as Elon Musk and all these other guys because I know God is so much smarter than any kind of artificial intelligence they can come up with. I'm not really worried about it. The, the AI has nothing on the Holy Ghost. If I'm led by the Spirit and, uh, and following the cloud, I'm not worried about AI. I'm not worried about any, that, any technology they can come up with. I'm not. Nobody, nothing, even this much compares to God and his wisdom. And so to God, that, the wisdom of men, that's foolishness. So I'm not concerned about AI. It could play a part. The Antichrist could use AI to manage some things. 
I am not worried about robots starting to think for themselves and coming attacking Mattoon. I'm not worried about that. So I'm not worried about AI, okay? So whoever asked that, it could play a part, but I don't think it's going to affect. It won't affect the church. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I believe those scriptures. Don't you? And so, amen. So I'm not worried about it. And so it could play a part. It could play a, a part in, you know, managing the numbering of everybody and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, I'm following the cloud. And remember what happened to Moses when they came to the Red Sea. The cloud went in and got between them and Moses. The, the, the water split. It blew all night. The air blew all night. And dried out the ground they went through. Do you think God couldn't do that for us? He absolutely can. So don't worry, don't lose a bit of sleep over AI. Okay. Brother, Brother okay. Robbins, I have a question yes. here from Brother Rick King. Sure. What, what would be your main reason, reason for believing in the timing of the resurrection and the rapture? If you just had one reason. Okay, yeah, I knew that would come. I told these guys last night, I know I'll get that question. So again, I want to make a statement. I'm not here to disprove anything you've been taught. Before we get here, I know where I'm at and what's going on. I'm not here to disprove anything. I'll give you my opinion, okay? Um, <clears throat> I'll give you one scripture for the sake of time. Uh, in, G in Matthew 24, Jesus was the Olivet Discourse. They asked Jesus, what's the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And he goes down through there. Take heed that no man deceive you. Many will come in my name. Uh, when you see this gospel will be preached in the whole world, then the end will come. When you see the abomination of desolation, let them which be in Judea flee. He's going down through. He's walking down. Boom, 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 boom. What's going to be the sign of it coming and the end of this age where we're at right now? Then he says in Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Uh, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Remember that statement. He didn't say before. He said after. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. With the sun be dark and moon shall not give her light. Stars will fall from heaven. The powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Then shall they see the coming of the Son of Man, and he will send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet to, to gather his elect. That's the rapture. Now, back up to the first sentence in Matthew 24, 29. When did, he, when did Jesus Christ in the Olivet Discourse say that that would occur? Immediately after the tribulation of those days. So, you say, well, hold on a minute. If you look at the end of the timeline here, that says second coming of Jesus Christ. The rapture and the second coming are one continuous event. Some people would say, no, that's the U-turn theory. I don't care if it's the U-turn theory or what. The fact of the matter is, is that the Bible says in Revelation 19, if you want to read it this afternoon, there's your homework. It gives a chronological set of events, how this thing takes place. The Bible says the bride hath made herself ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. The rapture happens we go straight to fight, or we um, go to the heaven and we have a, the marriage supper of the Lamb in the sky. He's, the Bible says he gathers them together. The dead in Christ rise first. We who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet them in the air. Okay? He's got to gather us from all over the place. There are dead in the sea. There are Christians that have been martyred. There are Christians that are my father-in-law in the grave, his mother and dad. I mean, people that went on before us. Many of you have people in the grave that will come out of the grave that day. And... We, the, we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet them in the air. We have the marriage supper of the Lamb in the sky. And the Bible says we immediately go to fight on behalf of Israel at the battle of Armageddon. We have to be gathered together for the marriage supper of the Lamb in the sky. This is Revelation 19. And then we go straight to fight on behalf of Israel at the battle of Armageddon. The rapture and the second coming is one continuous event. There's not a seven-year period in between that. And so, in, in my opinion, I, that's why we believe that many, a plethora of other scriptures that the rapture will happen at the end of the great tribulation, not prior to that. Now, if it happens prior to that, I will be will on our way up. I'll say, you know what? I was wrong. And I'm happy to do that because I'm not just relishing the fact that we got to go sue this. But the fact of the matter is, I believe that in my opinion, that's when it occurs. If, if, I'm, if I'm wrong, I'll, then we can say it on the way up. Dave, you were wrong. And I'd be like, cool, we're going up. That's all that matters to me. Be ready to go. That's all that matters. Because I could get hit by a bus on my way to the airport tomorrow, okay? So nobody's promised tomorrow morning. The timing of the rapture, I think I see it that way. But again, to me, the number one thing, be ready to go. Amen. That's number one. I'm not going to get hung up on the timing of it. It's a fun conversation to have, and I've had it 10 million times. But, um, you know, to me, the, the number one thing is be ready. Uh, yes. Brother Robinson, another question. Last night we we're talking about the pale horse, where one fourth of the world's population would die. 
how does that fit in with the timeline? Okay, I'm having a hard time. Hold the mic away from him a little bit. Go. Last night we are talking about the, the pale horse and one-fourth of the world's population would die during that time. Right, so How the thing is, um, so the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the, the pale horse, which should have been translated green, the original word in, in the King James Version, it says a pale horse. These are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The pale horse, the, pa the word pale there should have been translated green. The original Greek word was chloros, which is green. So uh, it's the green spirit, the green ideology. It is Islam, the rise of Islam. It's the last spirit to rise in the earth prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, again, I'm talking 100 miles an hour. In the Bible study, this all slows way down so you can get it in great detail, and there's proofs for everything. But uh, the Bible says um, that they were given control over a fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and famine and this, that, and the other. That does not mean that they will kill a fourth of all the population on the earth. There are about, so we hit 8 million population, according to the United Nations, in November of last year. 8, million, 8 billion population on the earth. Uh, Islam, um, there are about 1.9 billion Islamic adherents on the planet. About one-fourth. It's exactly what the Bible says. And they were given power so that they're given power over a fourth part of the earth, but they, they do kill with sword and with famine. Look at what's happened in this massacre that happened on October 7th. They, they, for some reason, they love hacking up people. It's totally demonic. It's not a human thing. However, it does not, the scripture there is not saying that they will kill a fourth part of all. Now, Revelation 9 does say in the third trumpet war, sixth trumpet war, that they will kill a third of all the men, all the population on the earth. But it does not, that's not what it's saying there, that they will kill a fourth part of the population of the earth. It simply says they will give a power over the fourth part of the earth. Then they will kill with sword and this, that, and the other. Um, so it's not saying that they'll kill a fourth part of the population of the earth in that scripture. Uh, anyone else? Brother Robbins. I got, yes. Uh, we'll go, get the mic here, uh, Pastor. Yeah, right. Okay, yeah, go. So United States is um, allied to Israel. With the war that is going on now with Israel and Biden and his administration, if they don't fully protect Israel, what happens to the United States? Sure. So I don't know what Biden will do, although I do know under the Biden administration that we have protected Israel several times now with UN Security Council veto power, even during this uh, conflict that's going on right now. However, I, I'll just tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says that we will specifically stand with Israel and protect her all the way through the end time. What Biden does, I don't know. He, so Biden is working with Iran to give them money which is supporting Hamas. But then on this hand, we've got ships sitting there ready to protect Israel should everybody come in. I honestly don't think Biden knows what he's doing fully. However, I know what the Bible says. Hey, yeah, amen. Wow, that was a good... Uh, the, so you guys are on the same page I am. Uh, the thing is, is that the, I know that the United States, the eagle's wings, when we talk about the modern day nation, if you go to Revelation chapter 13, the, the uh, world governing body, the federalization of nations. There, the Bible says it had the body of the leopard, Germany, the feet of the bear, Russia, the mouth of the lion, Great Britain, the ten horns of the ten horn kingdom, which is the current European Union, the reborn Holy Roman Empire. The eagle's wings in Daniel 7 are not mentioned there. What happened to America? Were we destroyed? Did we go into isolation? No. Jump back one chapter to Revelation 12, 14. The Bible says that <clears throat> when the war in heaven happens, halfway through the final seven years, Satan's bound to the earth. He persecutes the woman with 12 stars around her head, which is Israel in that chapter. It's not the mother Mary, okay? And he persecutes those that have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the church. Well, in Revelation 12, 14, this is the key scripture. The Bible says that the woman, Israel, is carried away in the wings of a great eagle, where she is nursed in her place for time, times, and half a time. When you move into Bible prophecy, the eagle is the United States, the modern day nation, of the United States. So that lets us know that the United States will stand with and protect Israel all the way throughout the end time. You say, well, that looks impossible under the Biden administration. Look at what happened to brother, uh, the testimony Jeremy had, this lady, we just got a speaker of the house that is ultra conservative. And he's a, he is a Christ, he's a fundamentalist, a Christian fundamentalist. And so, um, any, the Bible says God puts kings up and he takes them down. For some reason, God wanted Biden in there. 
Now, I don't know why. I can't explain everything God does. The Bible says the wicked are the sword of the Lord, but he can take Biden out tomorrow if he wanted to. Imagine this. My wife came up with this scenario, and I was kind of, I was like, wow. She, um, she said, I wonder if you understand that the Speaker of the House is the third in line. So what would happen if something would happen to Joe Biden and to Kamala? Guess who would be in president tomorrow? This conservative guy that just was, got brought Speaker of the House. Now, he, you heard the testimony that Jeremy gave about the guy knew he was going to be Speaker of the House before they ever elected him. So God's in control. At the end of the day, I'm sorry, I looked over here. Jeremy, you're back there. Um, the thing is, is that the, way, the thing I know is, is I know how the prophecies will play out. I don't know how we get from here to there. So I look to the events. I know these things are going to happen. And I look to those. And in my lifetime, many of them have clicked off just like that. My father-in-law followed this from the mid-60s. And he's lived through many of the fulfillments of Bible prophecy. And I, I, I wrote an article years ago about the, from the time Jesus was here to the Great White Throne Judgment. I laid out all the prophecies. A vast majority of these, you guys, have already taken place. There's, that's all that's left right there. That's it. Now, there are about 50 plus prophecies concerning the Antichrist. There are several that go along with that, but that's it. That's all that's left. Of the thousand concerning the second coming, that's left. That's it. Okay? So, not much left to go. When I say we're living in the end time, I mean, I can prove that a plethora of ways. But I know how things up. The Bible says we'll stand with Israel and protect her all the way through. Uh, and we've used our UN Security Council veto power. The other day, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution against Israel. The power does not lie in the General Assembly. The power lies in the UN Security Council. The United States have veto power over any resolution that's passed. So, just the other day, they passed a resolution in the General Assembly. My wife said, they passed a resolution in the General Assembly. I said, it's irrelevant. And, and we, are, we have the ability to veto all of that. We vetoed um, I think it's over 40 resolutions since the late 70s against the nation of Israel by the United Nations. We've vetoed, we've used our veto power over 40 times um, to protect Israel. And it looks like we'll do that all the way to the very end. The only thing I don't know about is the Battle of Armageddon. <clears throat> During the final seven years, we will protect her. Somehow, some way, the Battle of Armageddon, the nations will, be, will come down against Israel in the Battle of Armageddon. It doesn't mention the United States there. I don't know what's happened. Maybe we've lost our veto power. I don't know. Uh, but at this point, I know we will protect her all the way through this final seven years. And I'm thanking God that we do that because I've got a huge job in Israel to the point where I'm going to, at three years in, I'm going to door knock every home in the West Bank. Amen. Oh. So, yikes. Yes, sir. All right. You gave me the mic. Guess what? Oh, Jeremy, that's the, okay, no, go ahead. I'm, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> he handed him the mic. That's the, the anyway. I, I can take this guy. So. Okay. <laughs> I want to get that on video if you do that. I'm sharing that to all my friends. No, go ahead. The, uh, the Antichrist and where he comes from, there's scriptures and theologists that believe that um, because the Roman Empire was in charge, of destroying the city of Jerusalem mm -hmm. and the temple, that <clears throat> it will be um, Europeans or Romans or somebody that might yes. be the Antichrist. But in turn, what do you think of the Syrians were the five legions that went in there and destroyed the city? Mm -hmm. So is it possible that the Antichrist is actually a Muslim instead of a European or somebody from the Roman yeah. Empire? So you understand the faction of Muslims that are in Europe now. So he could, be a, he could be a Muslim. And the Bible also calls him the Assyrian. So he could, the Bible, a lot of people talk, say that he could come from the Turkish region, Turkey. And, but there are half a million Assyrians that live in Europe as well. So he could be, you know, a lot of people say he has to be Jewish. The Bible doesn't say that either. So he's going to come from Europe. I know that 100%. The way I know that is because the 10 horns of the 10 horn kingdom in Daniel chapter 7, the Bible says the, that um, a little horn will uproot three of those and he will, come, will have a mouth speaking great things. I can prove that that's the Antichrist. He specifically comes up 
among the reborn Holy Roman Empire, which is the current European Union. Uh, whether he is an Assyrian or whether he's an Assyrian prince or whether he's a Muslim or whether he's a European, I don't know the answer to that. He could be. But I know specifically that he does come from the European Union, which is the reborn Holy Roman Empire. When you think about Rome, the Roman Empire, the legs of iron on Nebuchadnezzar's vision, and the feet of iron mingled with clay, those are two separate empires. So the Holy Roman Empire is what the Antichrist comes from. Not the old, So put the Roman Empire, that's out of your mind. This is the Holy Roman Empire, which will be European-based. Remember the federalization of nations in Revelation 13. The Antichrist will come from Europe. He could be black, white, I don't know. But he will be a man, and he will be from Europe. Okay. Um, okay, I got four minutes. Anybody else? I can come up with them. Right back up here. Get, get, wait, wait till you get the mic, because I'll never hear you if you don't. This is a big church. <clears throat> Here's the deal, what we'll do too. If I don't get to you, you say, well, you didn't get to me, I, you're raising my hand. I, I, email me, drobbins at endtime.com. drobbins at endtime.com. I promise you I'll answer your questions. If you don't wanna raise your hand and answer it, that's fine. Uh, this is just, a, a, it's a great exercise, something to do um, that really helps people because somebody over here may ask something that somebody over here didn't ever even thought to ask. So drobbins at endtime.com because I'm about ready to close it down in three minutes. Yes, sir. Uh, will the Christians uh, have to make a choice on the mark of the beast? Okay, give me that again. Will Christians what? Have to make a choice when it comes to the mark of the beast. Okay, I believe, so in other words, I believe the rapture happens at the end of the great tribulation. I believe that we absolutely will have to make a choice. Here's the thing. I don't know that the, that the mark of the beast will become the law of the land here in the United States because there are three nations I can prove scripturally will not come under the reign of the Antichrist. The Antichrist will not rule the, every nation on the planet. When the Bible says he will rule, uh, that every, uh, every nation will bow to him, that, that it's talking in generalities. It's just like the United Nations. The Bible says every nation will come down against Israel to battle, but it's not gonna be every nation on the planet. Um, and I see my wife coming and I forgot something, so I'll get it, Jan, I got you. Uh, the thing is, is that it talks in generalities. So I know that the country of Jordan Daniel chapter um, 11, the Bible says that the, um, the king, uh, the, um, these shall escape out of his hand. The children of Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Edom is the Edomites in southern Jordan, the Moabites and the, Mo the Moab mountains in western Jordan, and Ammon is the capital of Jordan today. The Ammon, the Ammonites in the Bible. So Jordan will escape out of the Antichrist's hand. It will not come under the full reign of the Antichrist. Israel will never come under the full reign of the Antichrist. At the Battle of Armageddon, the Antichrist invades Israel. You do not invade a nation that you completely control, right? Number three, the United States won't. That should get a round of applause like you have never seen. I'm just, no, I'm okay. The thing is, I'm very thankful for that because we will stand with and protect Israel all the way through. The Bible says we will protect her against the serpent. The serpent's Satan and his world governing body. So we will stand with Israel and protect her, just like we're doing right now. Even under Obama, or uh, yeah, even under Obama, we were saying, uh, the Obama Biden, the Biden Obama administration, uh, we are protecting her against the world governing body. Because if you look right now, originally a lot of people came out against Hamas and what's going on, but now some of them are kind of favoring that cause in the international community. And so, but we're, we're using our veto power to protect her. So the, I don't think that the, in my opinion, I don't think the, the mark of the beast will become the law of the land here in the United States. There are, uh, Ron DeSantis in Florida, he has led 19 states to pass resolutions in their states that we would not use the central bank digital currency as, as currency in our states. 19 states have done that. That's huge. There are nine states that have laws on their books that an employer cannot force an employee to put a chip under their skin for means of identification to work there. It's against the law for them to fire somebody and, or to make them do that. And so that's in the United States of America. That is huge, nine states. So I don't know if it'll become the law of the land. They, there are people here who are globalists. Joe Biden's, his whole administration are globalists. They would love to pass that here. 
But there are some very powerful people. Thank God for our Constitution. I know a lot of people would like to make that a paper airplane and just, and a lot, a lot of them don't pay any attention to it, but we still are protected by the Constitution. And it really is important that you get the right governor. Because look at what happened during COVID. COVID was a, this much of a precursor to what we could see coming, how the, the governments and things could shut down. But there are, gov- and um, I'm v- great friends with Pastor Art Hodges in California. I just had him on my program the other day, and he talked about um, his church didn't shut down because they were allowing strip clubs and bars and casinos and all these things to open up, but they kept the church- churches closed down. So he ended up suing Governor Newsom in, in uh, California, I mean California. And he, uh, I got to stay off politics. I'm trying to stay on, but uh, he ended up suing him and it went all the way to the Supreme Court and Pastor Hodges won $1.6 million lawsuit at the Supreme Court and because California, and it's a precedence for all the other churches, if they're allowing the bars and everything else to stay open, this church will be allowed to stay open as that precedent. So the United States is very, very important what's happening. Okay. Really quickly, I forgot something, and when I saw my wife walk down that little lawn, I knew what was happening, but I need to collect those envelopes. And also, what we want to do, we want to, we want to take up an offering to help offset the, the uh, expenses of this meeting, uh, because these guys have been taking me out to eat, and they don't want me to go home uh, famished, and so uh, we want to take up an offering to help support that. So, I want to collect the envelopes. Number one, number one, check, I want to come to the Bible study. Last time we did this, they had like 80 or 90 people. You say, well, I've been through all this, Dave. Bring somebody. There's ev- everybody in here has somebody in your sphere of influence you can bring to the Bible study. It's very, very important. Again, it will slow way down in the Bible study and we'll walk you through all this stuff. I'll give you proofs for everything I've talked about tonight. And so uh, very, very important. Uh, it's a great way to win souls. You say, I couldn't do a Bible study. Bring somebody to this one. Um, and remember the guy who prayed here earlier um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Frank, wow, what a, that was a prayer. Come on. I love it. And so he's got some fire in him. And so he's going to be the one leading the Bible study. It's going to be awesome. So certainly would want to attend there. So let me say a word of prayer and uh, we will, we'll take up the offering here. Put your envelopes in the bucket. Very, very important. And, um, and then we'll, we'll let you go because I don't want anybody's roast to burn. Okay. And we want you back here at five o'clock because I'll be preaching. I don't, have, I don't have to do a PowerPoint. It's gonna be awesome. I'm not glued to a PowerPoint. So let's say a word of prayer here. I truly thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Thank you for everybody being here under the sound of my voice, the sincerity in their heart to come and want to know you more through your word, through the spirit that we feel here. Lord, we're all gonna go through this together and we want you to keep your hands upon each and every one of us. Help us to know and to have the revelations of the things that you would want us to realize here in these end times. We love you, Lord. We thank you and bless this offering to the furtherance of your kingdom and bless the giver. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so with that said, um, make sure you turn in your envelope. And uh, again, I'm gonna invite you back personally here tonight, five o'clock. These guys will be singing. These guys are world famous for their music. And I love coming here because I love music that gets it on. And so I, it's, I love amazing grace, but I also love it when you can feel the spirit and we're ripping it. And so, um, this church does both. It's so awesome. I'm inviting you back five to seven and we'll have an evangelistic service. We'll have an altar call for everybody in the place. I'm just telling you up front because I'm going to be preaching to every single person sitting here. Uh, and it's going to be great. So looking forward to that. Um, and I want to say with that said, you guys got anything? Okay. So, um, I love y'all. Thank you for coming. I know a lot of you traveled to be here. And if I haven't got to meet you yet, get up here. What are you waiting on? Um, Because I'm just trying to get people to heaven. I know I talk prophecy and I talk politics and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, we're just trying to make sure that when that trumpet sounds, which will be very soon, by the way, that your feet leave the ground. That's number one. So just be ready. Just be ready, okay? All right, um, I'm gonna wait till these guys get done. I will tell you that uh, what happened to us in Israel, really quick, I'll share this and then I'll let you go. Uh, what happened to us in Israel, I was at, I, I, it was very unnerving and I was asked